the throne of glory nothing in my hands I bring but the promise of acceptance from a good and gracious King I will give to you my burden as you give to me your strength. Come and fill me with your spirit 
as I sing to you this praise. You deserve the greater glory. And overcome, I lift my voice. To the King in need of nothing. Empty handed, I rejoice. You deserve the greater glory. And overcome with joy, I sing. By your love, I am accepted. You're a good and gracious king. And you would see me as your child and as your friend, safe, secure in you forever. I pour out my praise again. Lift it up, you deserve. Come on, you deserve the greater glory. it up to him and sing.
I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lift it up to him, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in Temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I fall on you. Why? Because Jesus, you're my hope and stay. That's right. And when I cannot stand, I fall on you. times that we say we need anything else, God, forgive us. Lord, we know we need you. God, we love you. We praise you. We worship you. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Be seated. I wore black and gray. And I publicly repented in front of everybody here, right? I did. And then this morning at 7 o'clock, I'm walking in here, and I look down, and I was wearing a maroon jacket. 
and we play the Redskins today. Someone has got to help me out in this, okay? Like I need, I need a color coding calendar going in my office somewhere that says avoid these colors on this weekend, right? So uh, I thought that would be a fun little story to start off. It was very true. And I, uh, Steve, Steve Hall would actually affirm that because he was here setting up for Bronco Park. And I said, hey, first thing I'm doing right now is going home and getting a different jacket. So, uh, hey, have you ever heard the phrase, I don't care? <laughs> okay, so some of you have, and <laughs> I can tell that you're not really comfortable with starting that way, right? Ever heard that? I don't care. Any of us with kids in the room, we've probably heard I don't care a lot, right? <laughs> and it's usually coming from them. Maybe uh, you tell them to do something, or if this happens, this is going to be the consequence. Well, I don't care, right? And so we have some kids in the room uh, this morning, and so welcome. And I'm not talking just about you this morning, because believe it or not, kids, all of us that are older than you, we were young at one point too. I know that's hard to believe, but we were, and we said the same things. I don't care. Uh, and then some of us in the room, and, and I'm, I don't want to stereotype too much, but I'll just use my own life here. Uh, a lot of times I hear I don't care when Libby and I are going out on a date night and and we are getting ready to, to kind of go out and hit the town and, you know, have a good dinner somewhere and kind of leading up to it. I'll say, hey, where would you like to eat, Lib? I don't care. And then I say, well, okay, let's go here. Uh, well, not there. Uh, well, okay, how about this place? Uh, not there. Okay, could you tell me where you do care that we're going to eat? Because I don't care. Sure seems like you care just a little bit, right? Anybody say amen if you've been in that boat before. Yeah, right. Um, I, I think we kind of hear this often. And whereas uh, both of these are probably genuinely true, kids uh, and uh, adults and all of these types of things, we're talking about cares because cares basically don't mean that I actually don't care. It just means that right now I don't have an opinion or I don't want to give you my opinion, right? So we just say, I don't care instead, but we actually do. Or it could actually mean like, I have no investment in making this decision or whatever it is, and so it doesn't matter to me. And whereas that, that may be the case more times than not, uh, my concern is that when we say this over and over again, it's, it's really just a callousness of our heart to whatever may be going on right in front of us, right? Maybe we've had some situations that have gone wrong for us, and so we say something like, I don't care, because we have a calloused heart towards whatever it is that is being asked, right? Right? And so sometimes in relationships, that can be like a, a kind of a domineering relationship is there. Maybe someone makes all of the decisions. And so we just say, I don't care because we think that, you know what, it doesn't matter what I say anyways, it's not going to matter. And so we say things like, I don't care. It doesn't matter what I say because this is not going to be any investment into the conversation at all. Or maybe a child could tell us, he doesn't care about something because they're, they're getting bullied or, or talked about or something like that. And so they just say, I don't care instead. But again, it's this callousness. They really do care. And there's some deep feelings and some pain that are there. And what happens is we actually do care because all of us have cares in the room. But sometimes we just say that because we're afraid of what might happen. And what happens is we just become kind of morally indifferent right, to whatever it is that is going on. And when I say indifferent, like a little bit of definition could, could come behind that. Indifference is just the silencing of emotions, right? Indifference is the silencing of emotions because we're not a people that is genuinely 100% indifferent. Uh, just like scroll on Facebook or Twitter, not now, that'd be rude, but uh, scroll on there this afternoon and you'll see that people are very different about what they think or feel, right? We're not indifferent, we do have opinions and so we don't silence them like we would like to think that we do and so because we just wanna hide our emotions a little bit, we just say something like, I don't care. By the way, this is especially even true for the follower of Jesus in the room. Right, because even for the follower of Jesus in the room, sometimes we say things like, I don't care, because our relationship with Jesus isn't going like we wanted it to go. Maybe we haven't had prayers answered in the way that we wanted them to be answered. Maybe we don't have the life that we thought we were going to have, and so we want to cast blame on the creator, and, and so we just have some indifferent kind of emotions that we're trying to silence, even in our relationship with Jesus. Maybe some have even been hurt by the church or by people of the church before. And so there's a callousness of the heart that says, I don't care. 
or genuine belief and genuine truth of the matter is that we do care. We don't want to wrestle around with the relationships or the emotions, and so we just give up, throw our hands up in the air and say, I don't care. See, the last two weeks, we talked about two parables, and both of those parables weren't specifically on prayer, but they were around prayer in those parables. And so I thought today, since we've wrapped up our parable series and we're getting ready next week to go into a series that we're calling Mission Accomplished, looking at the the last weeks of Jesus's life, how he accomplished the mission that he was set forth to, to do, I thought we would maybe, instead of talking around prayer today, talk a little bit about prayer. We've said a number of times that we want to be a praying church, and not just because we think it's something that we should do, but it's because We believe that it's something that God has called us to do because it changes things. And even more importantly, it changes us just a little bit. So we're going to focus on prayer from one of the primary verses that many of us know. This is what I call a coffee cup verse, right? Now, uh, before we say, yes, I love those coffee cup verses, let me explain. A coffee cup verse is one of those that we all know, we've all heard. We, we have it on maybe a coffee cup or a bumper sticker or written it in our journals and these types of things. But it's one of those that like we know and we have there, but maybe we don't even functionally like play it out every day in our life. Right, We have those as Christians sometimes. We just know these verses and we just say them and they have deep meaning if we really like walk in it. But a lot of times we just kind of say them and then we don't walk in them fully. And so if you've been around the church for a little while, you've heard this verse before time and time again. Please open up your Bibles if you have them with you to Philippians 4. We're going to be looking at just verses 6 and 7 today. Uh, If you do not have a Bible, uh, throughout the room, there are scattered around some black Bibles in the chairs kind of in front of you, or there may be some mixtures of some that are around. Feel free to get up and grab one. It's on page 982 of those black Bibles. Uh, If you don't have a Bible and you don't want to grab one of those Bibles, you can look on the screen, or uh, you can go ahead and click the Connect card in some of the seat uh, backs in front of you as well. There's a little little kind of laminated uh, like index card uh, that's got a QR code on it. And on that, Josh and the team have done a really good job of providing what's a link tree and on there it says scripture reading and you can just click that and it'll go right to the scripture today or if you don't like any of those options just look up on the screen we'll have it and I'll read it uh and so do that for those new to the bible Philippians is a letter a letter written by a man named Paul and those of us that are followers of Jesus in the room and have familiarity with the bible we know Paul was kind of a big deal in the church right he wrote nearly half the new testament um so a lot of what we have in our hands in the new testament is because of Paul it's the last kind of third of the Uh, the Bible that we have today in our hands. And Philippians is a letter from Paul back to the church in Philippi. If you want to read how the church in Philippi started, that's in Acts chapter 16. But but this is one of the warmest and kind of most gratitude-seeking type of letters that Paul wrote back to this church. He had a deep affection and a deep appreciation for the church in Philippi. And so this letter is filled with his appreciation. And like I said, you can go back to Acts 16 if you want to read how that uh, church actually started. It's, It's one of my favorite chapters in all of the scriptures, Acts 16 and 17. But what he's doing here at the back half of the letter is he's just giving some practical counsel to followers of Jesus in the church in Philippi, some very practical advice. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to read these verses, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to respond and see what it means to us today in our prayers. And so do me a favor. We started this a couple of weeks ago. If you're ready to hear from the Word, say Word. word. All right, let's go down front. Come on, they got you right here. It's Halloween morning, and they're like, ready. It's happy Reformation Day type of people coming down right here. If you're ready to hear from the Word, say Word. word. All right. Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7, it says, Don't worry about anything. Say that word, anything. Man. Some translations say, do not be anxious. Earlier uh, translations bring in the notion of be careful for nothing or full of care for in these, but it says anything. Don't worry about anything, but in everything. And, and this is the common pastor joke, right? You hear this time and time again. I don't know about you. I'm not like an English scholar. Uh, but anything and everything in my translations in the original uh, languages means anything and everything, right? You can put that in there. And so anything and everything. Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer. 
and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's bow our heads and pray. Ask God to speak to us today. Father, we love you. Pray that you would speak to us through your word. God, as we talk about prayer this morning, Lord, that, that you would guide us and direct us into how we should pray, what we should pray, what our prayers mean to you. Let's just not talk around prayer, but let's talk about and then actually pray, God. Do a work that only you can through your word. We love you and we praise you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. If you walk out of here with anything this morning, we're talking about I don't care and the cares that we have going on. I want you to understand this. According to this scripture and many other scriptures throughout the Bible, we see that prayer is actually the answer to your cares. I don't, I don't care what it is. I do. But prayer is the answer to the cares that you have. Because whether you want to admit it right here, right now in front of everybody else, whether with your spouse, a friend, a coworker, or anybody else, you do have cares going on in your life. You do have opinions and things that are going on. You have cares that are influencing the decisions that you make. And so I want you to know that it, according to the Bible that I read and believe in, prayer is the answer to your cares. And let's just kind of double click down and define a little bit more of what a care is. Care is the objects of our concern or our attention, right? They're feelings of anxiety, they're feelings of kind of want to or the desires that we have. They're feelings of affection for, for people and situations and processes and other things in our life. Sometimes we don't have a care in the world, and sometimes we have a lot of cares from things that are going on in and through our life with an outside influence. And all of these cares are important to us, but they're also important to God. And I want you to know that no matter the care that you have in your life, no matter what you are wrestling with today, right now, in here, this morning, vacations, jobs, family, friends, health, marriage, whatever struggle or whatever it is that you are walking through, all of them have an answer in the form of prayers to God. And so if all of the cares in the world for us have an answer through prayer, we probably need to spend some time seeing what it is that God says about prayer. And I think as you walk out of here this morning, you'll not only understand that prayers, prayer is the answer to our cares, but that there are three truths from this passages about prayer. And the first one is this, there is a purpose to prayer. There's a purpose to prayer, right? Now, I know that that seems really weird to mention that you know, talking to God about our cares. And this is hard for us sometimes because we go, he's the God of the universe. Like he created everything that we see. He gave life. He gave breath. Why in the world would he care about some of the things going on in tiny little Chris Phillips's life? Why would he care about the things that I care about? You see, whether you've been around Christianity for a while or you're still processing your thoughts about Christianity, you've probably thought that at some point. Maybe I thought that Christianity was not about asking the God of the universe to, to do things for me, but it was more about the do's and don'ts and walking around like robots doing all the things he wants us to do. There are things that God wants us to do, but I'm here to tell you that the God of the universe cares about your prayers and the cares that you have going on in your life, there's a purpose to prayer. And that purpose ultimately is communion with God. So, so when we are praying, we're literally talking to God. So the less we pray, the less conversation we have. Therefore, the more we pray, the more conversation we have with the God of the universe. One of the primary purposes for us being called as followers of Jesus, living the life of a Jesus follower to pray, is so that we can be in communion with God. And when we think God doesn't care, then we just don't talk to him, right? Like if I think that God doesn't care about my prayers and then I don't pray, then I'm not talking to God. 
I may check the box and I may do some things like pick up my Bible, listen to the Bible, or I may come to church occasionally and do those things. But what I'm doing is really cutting off communication with the living God. And very practically speaking, that wouldn't work well in my relationship with Libby at all. If I just said, hey, let me check a box a couple times a week and I'm not going to talk to you, but I'm going to be around you. I'm going to listen to you, but I'm not going to actually talk and commune with you at all. My marriage would probably struggle just a little bit. Would you agree? Yeah, probably. See, whereas God does want us to be obedient and read the Bible and follow the things that he wants us to do, I want you to know that God is interested in your cares in communion with him. And when we look at the purpose for praying from this passage, we see that God wants us to pray. He literally says, don't worry about anything but in everything. Okay, so if we're talking about prayer here and it's everything, that means I could constantly be talking to God, right? Because everything means everything. And so if I'm not to worry about anything, but in everything through prayer, literally the substitute for every care that you have in your life is prayer. What job should I take? Pray about it. Who should I date? Pray about it. What should I do about this home that we want to purchase? Pray about it. Where should I send my son to middle school? Pray about it. Doesn't matter what it is, pray about it. How about this one? God, give me the parking space, please. Right? Don't act like you haven't prayed that somewhere. I mean, like, don't, you laugh, right? Says, please, Lord, give me this parking space. I'm just, I'm trying to get into this area, right? Listen, can I tell you one thing? We joke and we talk about that, but you can pray about the smallest care and the greatest care in your life to God. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that God's going to give you that parking spot. But what I'm saying is we should never at any time think that God doesn't care about even the smallest cares that we have in our life. Because he does. Sometimes we think our prayers are too small and insignificant for God. Can I ask you something? Is anything too small for God? I mean, is anything too small for God? And can I tell you something else to put it in a different perspective? In comparison, everything is small in comparison to the God of the universe. The biggest care that you have in your life right now that you think is the biggest thing in the world, that is the most important, that is the hardest thing to ever overcome, you know who it's not a big deal to? God, he can overcome it. Even the biggest thing you have going on in your life is small in comparison to the God of the universe. You asking for what you think is unbelievably big in your life is a speck in the vastness of the universe that God created for us. The biggest thing that you can think about is small to God and the smallest thing that you can think about is important to him. Don't forget that the biggest thing you can think about is small to God, and the smallest thing you can think about is important to him. Nothing is too big or too small. God will answer, though, according to his desires, not yours. That's key, right? We don't just ask and he gives us what we want, but understand that he still desires to have communion with us in prayer. Never let something too small stop you from praying to the God of the universe. Because God says that the purpose of prayer is pray about everything (laughs) because it gets us in communion with him. Here's even the smallest thing, right? The thing that you think you can overcome. The correlation there is that when I think I can overcome it, you know who I don't need? God. But when I think that I can't even overcome the smallest of things, you know what that does? Puts me in the perfect posture for prayer. Lord, I can't do it. This thing seems really small to me, God, but I can't do it. You know who can? You can. Please, Lord, be with me. And so by praying even the smallest of things in our life, it gets us in a communion of God and gets us in a right posture of letting him know, I can't do it, but I know that you can. So very simply, the purpose of prayer is to pray about everything, letting God know that he is in charge, and then you know what you do? You just start praying. <laughs> and so this, this week, I want you to do this. Make a commitment that no matter what it is, you're just going to start praying. 
the biggest things that you have going on, the smallest things that you have going on. Just start communing with God. And then you might be saying, okay, well, how do I pray? Well, the second truth that we see from this passage is that there is a, not only a purpose to prayer, but there is a process to prayer. Look at what Paul says. He says, don't worry about uh, anything, but in everything through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Okay, so through prayer and petition, that seems a little bit redundant, right? How do we need to say prayer and petition? There's many reasons for this. And I think one of the reasons that it's put in like this is to remind us again that we need to be praying about everything and we don't just need to be praying it one time. If we see here, prayer gets repeated. In the scriptures, prayer is repeated. It's talked about a lot in the scriptures. I'd venture to say this. If there is something in your life that you are asking God for only once, you probably have your answer to whether or not you're, you're looking for, right? And if I can only ask the God of the universe one time for this thing that I'm praying for, I could probably tell you that it's not that big of a deal. Because if I just pray one time and then it's done, I'm probably not that engaged with it, or it's probably not that significant going on in my life. And so some of prayer is just the repetition of praying and asking God over and over again. You know, but we live in a Google it world, right? We're like, I can Google something right now and find out the answer that I need to. And so what we do is we treat God like Google. I pray one time, I don't get the answer that I want, so I just stop. That's not what we see in the scriptures. Prayer, petition, repeated. But then he also says, prayer and petition, present your requests to God. Now this is intelligent praying. This is specific praying. Right? Present your requests to God. I don't know about you, but sometimes I get guilty of, oh God, you know what's going on. And there's truth in that. He does. But you know what else he wants us to do? He wants us to be specific and clear in what it is that we are asking him for. Because he wants to do more work in us than it is even who we are praying to, right? Because if I can get very specific in my prayer, if I can get very clear in my prayers to God, then I have an understanding of what it is that is going on inside of me more so than just saying, hey God, I pray that you would just do that work. You know what it is. God, just do it. I'm asking you, please. Not saying that those prayers are not good, but this says, present your requests to God. And, and what happens is sometimes we don't care because we're sitting here thinking, well, the God of the universe knows the number of hairs on my head and did so before the foundation of the world was created. Why in the world do I have to get that specific with him, right? But can I tell you this? A, a mentor of mine said it this way, Dr. Steve Gaines in, in Memphis, he said, there are some things God does, whether or not we pray, but there are some things God does when we pray. There are some things God's going to do, whether or not we pray, but there are some things God does when we pray. Watchman Nee is a theologian that I, I love reading. He said it this way, our prayers lay, down, uh, lay the track down to which God's power can come. Like a mighty locomotive, his power is irresistible, but it cannot reach us without rails. Our prayers are the rails that God uses. How do I know that's true in Scripture? For those of you that have a familiarity with the Bible, uh, Isaiah is an Old Testament portion of the Bible filled with prophecy, filled with some great Scripture, right? Prophet Isaiah is one of the, 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 my favorite ones to study. And in Isaiah 37, there is this, 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 these Israelite people are walking through some tough times. We have King Hezekiah that is walking through this with them, and then you have the prophet Isaiah. But you also have this, like, villain. His name is Shennacherib. And Shennacherib is mocking God. He's mocking the people. He's doing all this kind of stuff. And, like, a couple of times he did it, and they prayed. And Hezekiah asked Isaiah to pray for him. And so he goes, and he prays, and then it comes back and returns. And so finally, Shennacherib comes in and just, like, presses the limit with Hezekiah. And so Hezekiah goes up to the tower, and he prays to God. And then God speaks to Isaiah and says, give this message to Hezekiah. And Isaiah 37, 21. And what it says in that verse is, because you have prayed to me about King Sennacherib of Assyria. 
And he comes through and he destroys all of them. You know what that tells me? If he didn't pray, something different would have happened. Man, I will never understand why the God of the universe would choose to use someone like me for my prayers to be guardrails for anything to him to do, any track that he has going down for anything in the world. I will never understand it, but when I read scripture, I know that there are some things God's gonna do, whether or not we pray, but there are things that God does when we pray. So there is a purpose and a process to our prayers. Listen, God, God wants us to present these requests, not so that he can know them, but because, because he already does, but so we can know what is important to us, like I mentioned. Your specific prayer isn't for God, it is for you. I mean, if you can't pray it, then maybe you shouldn't do it. If you can't ask God to bless it, then maybe that's your answer. Just let that settle in, right? And by the way, it, it also says thanksgiving. I think not only repeating this over and over again, not only being specific, but we need to pray with thanksgiving. Why? Well, the scripture says so, but also because have you ever noticed how your cares are differently when you give thanksgiving to something? When you start to praise God for who he is, it starts to minimize the things going on in your life that you don't seem like you can get over. When we pray with thanksgiving, it postures our hearts a little bit differently as we approach God. Even as we compare ourselves to people around the world, right? We're very westernized and Americanized in our prayers. But if we would look at what happens globally, in the universe that God created, we become, begin to pray a little bit more with thanksgiving. And what that does is that seems to minimize some of the prayer, uh, the, some of the cares going on in our life. Maybe we're hurting for some reason, but as, as we pray to God with thanksgiving, we say, hey God, I'm hurting in this specific situation, but, but God, because I'm hurting in this situation, I feel drawn closer to you. And feeling drawn closer to you is better than anything that I could do right now for myself. Would that puts a different posture on our prayer, right? This week, make a list. Go through it. Walk through specific requests that you can commune with God about. Ask him several things. Make a list of five things, three things, two things, one thing. I don't care what it is. Make a list of things that you can specifically talk to God about over and over and over again. I think that'll change the posture that you have in walking to prayer. I think ultimately the last truth that we see from the scripture is not only that there is a purpose for our prayer or that there is a process for prayer, but there's also a product of our prayer life. Look at the last verse. Verse seven says, and the peace of God. Say peace. Just saying it feels different than the world around us, right? which surpasses all understanding, will guard. And when we look at this word guard, when you look at the original language, it was the same military term used for garrison. So it's a a garrison, which is a a, a body of troops that were stationed uh, around a town to defend the town. So this word guard is not just like, oh, it's just gonna guard. You know, we kind of read by it. We look at it on our coffee cup verse. We kind of go through it. And it's like, no, 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 this is a Station of troops guarded around you to protect you at all cost. That's what happens when we pray. What does it guard? Our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. You see, the product of prayer is not to get the answer that we desire, but it's to get the peace that God wants you to have. When you pray, it's not to get what it is that you are praying for. It's not to have the answer that you are looking for. It's not to have the things that you desire. But ultimately, the product of our prayer is so that we can have the peace that only God gives. That's the product of our prayer life. See, the hardest thing for us to overcome in our prayer life is that we want the answer that we desire. We do. Sometimes we don't even pray it because we we know that God's not going to give us the answer that we want. So we're just like, I don't care. 
We pray things like, Lord, give me this job. Help me uh, in my current position. Lord, sell our house today. Lord, uh, don't let me fall into the same trap that I always fall into, right? When, when the Lord was calling me into full-time ministry out of medical sales, um, I was wrapping up seminary, and we were in Memphis, Tennessee. And as we were there, there's a church there in Memphis called Bellevue Baptist Church. It's a, a, a very kind of historic uh, church in the city, uh, bigger church, and, and just some great leadership and history there. And we were already there. I was there five years as a lay leader and a deacon at that church. And so, I mean, like I wanted a job very badly at the church that we loved. And, and there were some like positions that were there. And like I began to interview for these positions. And, and it was the longest interview process I'd ever walked through known to man. I, I think they were just like, man, I don't know about this guy. And uh, we're, we're going to hold off just a little bit. <laughs> no, but what it, what it was, in my opinion, was that God was reposturing my heart. So every day you drive by this place, there's huge crosses that are on the interstate right next to the church. Uh, it's on 300 acres. It's 750,000 square foot building. Like it's a monstrosity of a place, right? And so we're driving by, we're looking at all that, and I prayed every day, God, give me that job. Man, it lines up. We love these people. Lord, this is perfect. And then one day, God broke me. Because I don't think if God answered that prayer differently, if he would have said no, that I would have been okay. I would have said, man, I don't think this is your will, Lord. What are you doing? Anybody ever said, hey, God, what are you doing? And they answered prayers, right? Don't raise your hand. I don't want you to implicate yourself. We do. We say, God, I, this, I know what would be better for me, Lord. And then one day as I was driving by, just very clearly the Lord laid on my heart, would you be as happy if I didn't give you this job for my will being done? Because I was praying, God, let it be your will. And if it's your will, man, this is going to be awesome. But I didn't pray if it's not your will, this is going to be awesome too, right? We, don't, we just leave that part out. But that day, the Lord really broke my heart. And I said, God, if this is your will, let it be done. And I'll rejoice and make your name known. And if your will is not for me to have that, I'll rejoice and make your name known because I want to follow your will, not mine. You see, this product of prayer is not me getting what I want, but it's me having a different posture towards the God of the universe. Now, I ended up getting a job at Bellevue Baptist Church, but that... It's not because I was praying for it. That's because it was God's will. And what happens is this peace comes over our minds. Now, I was looking up peace, right? What does peace even mean? Do we even know what peace means nowadays, right? How can our hearts and minds be guarded with peace? We have all this other stuff going on in and around the world. And I, I came to a Harvard medical study that took MRIs of brains. Now, full disclosure, not a doctor. I'm about to just butcher some words, but I'm going to say them very confidently, okay? This, this uh, study took brain MRIs of people that had prayed, and did you know that the deeper parts of the brain in this study by Harvard Medical Research, the medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex, come on, the midfront and back portions, which are the ones that deal with self-soothing and reflection, were activated more in the people that were praying. That's not a church study. None of us are getting around studying prefrontal cortexes, right? This is a Harvard medical study that looked at people in the areas of their brain that dealt with self, self-soothing and reflection. The ones that prayed more had more peace. Why? Because the Bible tells me in the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, if you pray in anything about everything, it's going to guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Understand this, church. Delays are not denials, and no is not an answer to whatever it is that you're praying for. Prayer isn't to get the answer that we desire, but it's to give the peace that God provides. I mean, if we're being really honest, is anybody in here thankful that God didn't answer that prayer for that person that you dated a long time ago that you prayed for, right? You're laughing because you're there. <laughs> My life would look drastically different if God answered that prayer when I was in college, right? I mean, like the theologian Garth Brooks said, uh, some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. <laughs> now, he's a little off in his theology because the prayer was answered. The answer was just no, Right? He's, Garth Brooks is actually not a theologian. He's a country music singer for those that are a little bit lost right now. Kids in the room are going, who's Garth Brooks? And that is just sad, right? <laughs> 
And can I tell you that many times over, God's answered in a way that I didn't want him to answer in, but I have a greater peace now than I've ever had my entire life. It's because I'm wanting to follow and submit to his will, not mine. So pray. Ask God to do only things that he can do. Ask for things that are very big. Ask for things that are very small. Do it very specifically. Do it with a thankful attitude. Do it over and over and over again and watch a peace that God can give you overcome you like you never thought it could. See, and the peace that God gives us is because we are in right relationship with him and we understand what our lives look like and who holds them for eternity. The peace that only we get that says, hey, it doesn't matter what the answer to this prayer is. I want you to know that for eternity, your life is right with me. The peace comes from understanding the person and the work of Jesus. It comes from understanding that God sent his only son to die a death on a cross that he didn't deserve, but we did, so that if we ask him to forgive us of our sin, if we place our faith and our trust in him, he would be faithful in both of those things, and we would have a right relationship with him forever in heaven. You want to talk about peace? Who cares what in the world is going on right now? At the end of the day, the only thing that is going to give you a peace that surpasses all understanding is knowing and understanding and living in a right relationship with the person and work of Jesus Christ. If you believe that, say amen. That's where the peace comes. Knowing that this world is fading and fleeting quickly, but that we have that right relationship. I was talking to somebody earlier. You, you know that even the church in Philippi, the church in Ephesus, all of these churches that we read about, you know none of them are in existence anymore? None. You can go walk those grounds. Those churches don't exist. So sometimes we put really small things in comparison to eternity, right? Eternity says, let's pray for things that only we can have through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so here's what I want to do to conclude. I'm gonna do something just a little bit different. If you notice, we didn't do our normal prayer time uh, in the beginning with worship. I think it'd be really weird if we talked about prayer here for 30 minutes or so and then didn't actually stop and pray, right? And so as Ethan and his team get ready to come back up here right now, I, I want you to do me a favor, and here's what I want you to do. We just want to take a posture of prayer. I don't care whether you're sitting, whether you're standing, whether you come down here at front, whether you talk to someone next to you, but we're going to stop and we're going to pray. Why? Because I believe that prayer is the answer to every single one of the cares that are going on in this room right now, that Jesus himself is interceding on our behalf. And so do me a favor and let's just bow our heads and kind of get into a right posture of prayer. The way to get into a right posture of prayer first is to recognize who it is that we're praying to. We're praying to the God of the universe. So as we begin to pray, let's just pause for a minute. I want you to thank God just for who he is.